Yes, uh, thank you very much, Matthias, for, for the introduction. And um, of course, all, also a warm welcome from uh, my side. We are very glad uh, to have um, such a good resonance on our topics of, of ET2 SMEs. And um, yeah, as uh, Matthias already said, Agate Regional Development Agency of Aran Region, we are leading this uh, project. Um, I would like uh, to give you, first of all, uh, a very brief uh, overview in 10 minutes, what uh, ET2 SME is about and what are we um, offering. Uh, first of all, um, well, it's of course about the Einstein telescope. I think most of you uh, are already familiar with this, with this uh, really cutting edge um, new research infrastructure of European and uh, maybe even global um, importance. Um, maybe you can uh, go further, Matthias. Um, on, the, on this first slide, you just see some cornerstones about the investment that is uh, connected with this uh, new facility about the jobs uh, that uh, are to be expected and also the candidate locations there are only two and um, i think uh, the more uh, the process is proceeding uh, it is uh, the, the the perspective and chances are getting better and better for this cross-border region here you also see the time path which is uh, uh, heading further out than 2032, but as you can see from our uh, activities and also from the various projects that we already now um, do concrete activities. Uh, what is the, the target of ET2 SMEs? If you go to the next slide, um, you can uh, see that we first of all want to inform and involve especially companies, um, SMEs, of this uh, extended cross-border region of Belgium, the Netherlands, and North Westphalia into this process of uh, establishing the Einstein telescope and let them profit. And more specific, what we want is to foster cross-border uh, cooperation of businesses uh, in the ET relevant technologies, in the instrument, and also in the geology technologies. Uh, by doing uh, or by setting up concrete uh, cross-border innovation projects. Um, to the next slide. What we, what we offer via ET2 SMEs is a kind of value chain and you, you can see here the various uh, elements of this uh, chain, starting with mapping and ending up with uh, sustaining what we are doing. Um, I um, just want to give you a brief uh, overview on what we are doing and Katrine de Pape, uh, the next speaker, will step a little bit deeper in various topics uh, that are ahead of us now. The next slide. Um, if we talk about mapping, we are talking about two uh, different elements. The first, um, next slide, please is about mapping the technologies. So what you can find here on uh, the et2smes.eu website is the so-called ET Technologies online catalog. You can see which uh, technologies are needed, which are technologies are addressed from this huge new research facility in the instrument, but also um, in the uh, geology technologies um, click please once more. Um, you can see that um, we have for each technology a short description. What is state of the art? What is needed here uh, in terms of the Einstein telescope? Which improvements are needed? What are economic perspectives? Uh, which um, ongoing or future procurements um, will show up? So all these information uh, are available via the website. So you can dive a little bit deeper here in each technology. Mapping, uh, going to the next slide, uh, means also a mapping of actors, mapping of companies, mapping of research um, and universities uh, that are dealing with the Einstein telescope. So we offer a new 
online platform, also on our website, uh, where all companies and all research um, um, actors can be present. So um, register via the website and present yourself. Uh, what we do is not only show the icons in the map, but also offer such an info profile where each entity uh, can briefly uh, display what they are doing, uh, where they are and what their markets are. So this is a very um, good and very easy going uh, opportunity to be present here on this new mapping tool. Next slide. Um, then uh, going a little bit deeper, we are doing various um, visit and also networking activities. First of all, um, we have the, the various company visits that our partners, please to, to the next slide, um, are, um, are carrying out. So looking all over the cross-border region, the four different regions of North Westphalia, uh, Wallonia, Flanders, and, uh, uh, um, and also the Netherlands, we have carried out more than 180 company visits in the first year of ET2SMEs in order to talk one-to-one -one and explain what we are doing, what we are offering. And you can see also which uh, different competencies we already uh, have, uh, have found out. The next. Um, what we are also doing is uh, participating in networking events, uh, but also yeah, carrying out own events like this one here uh, too. So you have the opportunity and will have the opportunity in uh, following uh, up um, events uh, to get in contact with other companies. Uh, this year will be the last uh, online uh, virtual events. So uh, starting from end of April, we will uh, also go back to, to physical uh, events. So where you really have the opportunity to get in contact with others. The next one. Um, very important is also what we offering in terms of uh, concrete business contacts uh, and consortia building. Um, what um, what we are um, uh, what we are uh, supporting is the establishment of project ideas, but also the search for project partners across borders. If you click, please, once or two times more, we set up meetings with potential uh, partners and those partners, of course, can also then uh, apply for vouchers, apply uh, for funding that we are providing. Next one. Um, well, the vouchers and the innovation projects, a little bit more, more concrete about that. Um, um, we have um, um, so-called um, innovation vouchers, grants between 25,000 and 50,000 um, euros uh, that we are uh, providing for cross-border SME-driven innovation projects, a minimum of two companies from two sides of the national borders. And we, are, we have ongoing calls here here you see the one from February, the third call is now currently going on. And um, going to the next slide, um, we can also announce that uh, uh, within the last days, the first, the first um, uh, cross-border um, innovation voucher was already uh, granted. So we have granted the 50,000 euro vouchers to the combination of Fionec uh, and uh, Johnson Precision and Engineering. Um, and um, yeah, this, um, this project is the first one that is currently running. Others additional ones will follow. Next one. And last but not least, I will close also with uh, some sustaining activities. Um, very important that we are working on an uh, industrial advisory board, um, which will uh, have regular meetings of all ET uh, relevant uh, businesses and research uh, entities of this enlarged cross-border um, area. Um, 
So um, this is also an opportunity pointing out already towards uh, the, uh, the running facility. So pointing out also beyond the ongoing uh, projects. So th this is really in a nutshell what we are doing. So if you have any questions, please um, please refer to the different partners you can see here. Please refer to the uh, website uh, that I already mentioned and you can find there all further information. So, uh, so thank you very much for this, uh, for this uh, first, uh, um, um, for, for this very first uh, uh, talk here. And uh, I will now hand over um, to Katrin, uh, who will step a little bit deeper into the different uh, offers and different opportunities. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ralph, for the introduction. All of you, welcome also from my side. And I want to thank you to be here and also for the ones who will present. Thank you for your presentations. Um, now, in the next 10 minutes, I would like to address me to the companies uh, because I would like to tell the companies what's in, the, in it for them, what's in it right now, uh, right here, what are the opportunities thanks to the Einstein telescope. So that means that I won't talk about the future opportunities like, for example, once the, if the Einstein telescope comes to this region, you can be a supplier for the Einstein telescope. That's something for the future. Today, I want to focus on today. And I see, if you go to the next slide, please, I see four main opportunities. Um, that are the tenders, the vouchers, and networking, and that all leads to more visibility. So now I will, in this keynote, I will talk to you through these four elements, starting with the first, and that are the tenders. So Ralph uh, already told you about the project ET2 as a me, but there are still two other scientific programs. It's the ET Pathfinder, which is a functional scale model of the Einstein telescope. It's situated in, at the University of Maastricht. And the other, and um, for this audience, more relevant um, scientific program is the E-Test, because they're the testing components and they are also um, studying geology. And we have some speakers um, in the rest of the event, who will tell you more about the challenges and uh, the situation on that matter. So both scientific programs write out different tenders. And um, you can find the tenders on the website. That's the link is on, on the slides. Or just Google e-test procurements and you will find it also. There on that website, all the tenders that are announced or that are still to come are published, are lists. And the ones that are open, you can click on them and then automatically you come to a, a, a formal. If you go to, to, to the next slide, so like something like that, where you can register and you can find all the specifications, drawings, details of the tenders that are open. And you can also make your bids there. So um, keep that in mind, that website. Uh, look at it and uh, make your bid. And we all wish you a lot of success with it. That was the vouchers. Now we come to the vouchers. That were the tenders. Now we come to the vouchers. And a big difference between the vouchers and the tenders is that for the tenders, you are a supplier of a scientific program for the vouchers, it's all about your core business. So the idea is that your core business shall improve. So when you take your core business to the next level, when you create uh, a new or an improved product um, and so on, for all these ideas, um, you can have a voucher. And that voucher is up to 50%. And how does it work? Like um, Rolf already mentioned a bit. Um, first of all, we hope that you are 
inspired by all the challenges and technologies of the Einstein telescope. And then if you are inspired and you got an ID, it's up to create a consortium. If you click a few times further, yeah, yeah thank you. So how does a consortium looks like? It has to be at least two companies. One of them should be an SME because only the SME is eligible for funding. For funding. It also has to be a cross-border con consortium. So that means a Belgian company with a German company or a Dutch company or a Dutch company and a German company together. Surplus, you can add, so still, sorry, I'm not, I'm from Limburg, that's not that fast. <laughs> um, uh, you can also add a third or a fourth company on, or a larger uh, enterprise or a knowledge institution to that consortium. Then you work to your project ID and your project ID will be assessed. And the assessment criteria are ET relevance. So it has to be relevant, there has to be a link with the Einstein telescope. Innovative, it has to be your ID should be new or should be an improvement. And third, also market potential. That's a very important one because the market potential is, like I said, it's about your core business. So it's not only providing something for the Einstein telescope. No, it's about your core business, your market or new markets that you want to uh, address. And for that, you can give a voucher of you can you can receive a voucher up to 50% with a maximum of 50,000 euros a project so if the consortium is are two SMEs it's 50,000 euros max if the consortium has one SME it's 25,000 euros max then you are to the next slide and that gives us to the last geographic condition because I said it has to be an SME, but the SME must also be situated in the extended Eurasian mass RN for to, to be eligible. So that means for Belgium, the SME must be located in Limburg, Liège, Leuven, Rui, or Warem. For the Netherlands, it's Limburg, Zuidoost, Brabant, and for Germany, Aachen, and the Eiffel. So the location is a condition for the voucher, but it's also an opportunity for you because it means that you can network internationally. And that brings me to the next slides and to the third opportunity for you guys, it's networking. Rolf also mentioned that um, it's very interesting to network around the Einstein telescope because First of all, it's international, like I said, but second of all, there's also not only companies, but also knowledge institutions and also the, the, the scientific criteria of that and the, the scientists who work on it and also government is involved. And you can all meet the stakeholders. Where do you meet them? Well, you meet them at our workshops I suggest. Uh, last minute. Okay, thank you. Um, so here you see the different workshops that we organize. And I think that the most important for you is W3 and W5, because that's our geological elements. There is also the advis advisory board. If you see to the next slide, it's the 29th of April. And this is also a very nice one because you can visit the ET Pathfinder, the functional scale model uh, that is at the University of Maastricht. And that brings me to the last point, the visibility. And it's a very clear one. If you are, if you can, if you have a tender, you can go to the next one, Matthias. If you can have a tender, you can deliver products for a big science project. And that's a great image builder vouchers, you can reach for new clients and new markets and networking, of course, that increase your visibility. So for all of that, you can contact us and we are happy to help you. Thank you very much. I would now like hand over the presentation to
Joseph Dickmans, who will tell us more about big infrastructure projects. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Katrin. Uh, uh, well, first of all, uh, welcome to uh, all of you also from my side and uh, thank you for the opportunity to uh, talk a bit about uh, managing and starting up big infrastructure project, uh, projects. Uh, my name is Joseph Hickmans, I work for Tactical Engineering and uh, within the Belgian branch I'm uh, responsible for uh, the tunnel projects in, in Belgium. Uh, next slide please. Uh, so, oh, that came out a little bit different than I thought. Uh, I see the, the white dot has disappeared, so the text is uh, quite difficult to read, I realize. But uh, I will tell it, so Tractabel, it's, uh, it's an, uh, a global engineering company and worldwide we have around uh, 5,000 people, experts and uh, engineers uh, present. Um, we uh, aim for solutions uh, in a carbon neutral and sustainable future uh, where people, planet and profit uh, uh, thrive to, uh, collectively. And uh, we try to connect strategy with design, with engineering and project management. Um, we are divided in four main branches, uh, which is uh, called urban, which are called urban energy, nuclear and water projects. And uh, next slide, please. Um, and uh, so uh, tunnel projects is part of what we call urban uh, projects. So uh, it's all related most of the time with uh, transport uh, infrastructure. So uh, tunnel projects in general, uh, uh, well, specifically if you, if you live in, in the region of, of, uh, uh, of Bel if the eastern part of Belgium, and you have to go to the western part. Most people here, I think, uh, will know uh, that it is quite a problem. Eh? You have to pass through Antwerp or to Brussels and you're, uh, you're in, uh, in, in, uh, in, in trouble uh, around Antwerp, around Brussels. Uh, so we see that infrastructure uh, is becoming quite uh, problematic. So it, it means that these last years, there were also quite some investments done in tunnel projects uh, to get traffic uh, below ground. Uh, some examples are of uh, the Osterwil connection in Antwerp. Uh, in Belgium, uh, but also in Maastricht, you have uh, recently finished a few years ago the A2. Uh, we have Northside Kempen, uh, Diablo Project, etc. Many more, but they are all uh, characterized by uh, being a very complex environment. Uh, on the right hand side, right hand side of the slide, you see some projects uh, achieved by by the Tactical or Tactical was involved in that. So we did some uh, new builds, uh, some renovation projects, uh, which I will not go into detail uh, now. Next slide, please. Uh, so to come to tunnel projects in general, because we are here, of course, with Einstein telescope. And uh, although uh, aside from the magnificent concept of, of detecting uh, gravitational waves, uh, it is also before you can do that, it's, it's quite a project. Uh, uh, and it's also a tunnel project. Uh, because we talk about uh, 30 kilometers of, uh, of tunnel infrastructure, 200 meters or something like that below ground. And so in general tunnel projects, when we, uh, in, in our experience, uh, what's, what's it's about? Uh, first of all, it's, it's always about a largely impacted area, uh, which means that uh, many stakeholders are involved in, uh, in this kind of projects. It's also a multidisciplinary project. It's not just about drilling uh, a tunnel. Uh, uh, there's a lot more to it. Uh, uh, many different disciplines need to work together and also very specific expertise is uh, necessary to, to achieve that. And if we talk about big projects, uh, because tunnel project most of the time, when you talk about big uh, budgets, you also talk about uh, many people and uh, also many risks regarding communication and project control that are popping up. And on the right hand side of the slide, uh, maybe some of you recognize this, but this is not an ancient picture of the Tower of Babel. But you have to be careful that you don't end up in a scenario like that, uh, specifically with these kind of projects. Next slide, please. So it's all about uh, collaboration and follow up. 
so uh, I, I put here a small sketch uh, uh, in the center. Uh, of course, you are, as a client, uh, you uh, define the needs, uh, uh, what is necessary, for example, for Einstein telescope to be, uh, to be able to operate. Uh, uh, but at the same time, uh, you have a way to achieving that. Uh, you have a route to go. So you need to mitigate your risks. And by choosing your location, uh, you know, there are two sites which are in the running. Uh, you also stake out, uh, state out the, the conditions of, uh, of your project. And uh, in order to achieve that, you have to be very alert on different fields. So first of all, you have to recognize that uh, most of the time, the client is not capable of doing the project uh, completely by itself. So you need many other parties that are uh, to be involved. You need engineers, uh, sometimes architects, uh, contractors, facility management, uh, you name it. Uh, uh, there are many, many different experts, etc., that need to be uh, involved in your contract, uh, in your uh, project. So. It's important also to think about uh, contract management with all those different parties and technical management uh, that uh, for realizing uh, your dream. Huh? Uh, at the same time, you need to be uh, very wary about uh, managing and controlling your quality, your planning and your cost, uh, specifically talking about these kind of large tunnel project, they do have an uh, uh, they intend to go out of budget. Uh, there are many examples in the past uh, around us uh, where, where you see sometimes that in the newspaper. So it's very important to, to have a thorough follow-up of, uh, of uh, project management and uh, project control. And uh, last but not least, I would say, uh, if you talk about these kind of big projects, you also talk about many stakeholders, uh, both on private or on public side. Public side, of course, we know under the form of permits uh, that, that are need to be uh, achieved. And specifically in an area where you have different countries, the legislation can be quite different. Uh, so um, it's uh, important to know this. Uh, and uh, so in environment management is, is very crucial on that. On the right side, there's a small picture uh, that uh, about a system that is used by Rijkswaterstaat in the Netherlands. It's called Integrated Project Management, which also has a way of dealing with all these different aspects. And uh, but there are many many uh, systems that you can use. Uh, although, uh, the most important thing is that you keep in mind that these aspects are important in your project. And I will come back to that a little bit more in detail in the next slides. Uh, next slide, please. So if you talk about the timeline uh, for such a project, um, well, uh, for, for a project like this, achieving it and then becoming, uh, getting to the, your operational phase, uh, as, as we put it, it's, it's quite a straight line. Eh? So um, it uh, starts with a feasibility uh, and conceptual study. And I think this is the, uh, this is where we are right now with, uh, uh, with uh, Einstein telescope. But once you have the green light, then it starts with basic detail engineering, uh, execution phase and operational phase, where well, many aspects that do have an impact on the, on the cycle as a whole. Uh, in parallel, you have to be uh, aware that you also have these permit and expropriation uh, procedures that are uh, going on. And uh, most of the time they start somewhere after basic engineering because uh, you need to have nowadays quite a good idea about uh, what you're going to do and what the risks are on environment before you get a permit and uh, you also at the same moment which is the third uh, branch i would say is procurement huh? uh, you need to think about uh, when to involve certain parties when to involve a contractor uh, what is the wisest thing to do for your project of course, this is now a straight line, but in, in reality, it's a circle. It's, it's something that continues, specifically if we talk about tunnel infrastructure and also for Einstein telescope, we are not talking about uh, a two year lifespan, lifespan like with our LED uh, television. We are talking about 50 or 100 years uh, or something like that. 
So we need to think about uh, not only having a project ready in a couple of years, but also how to maintain it and uh, how to deal with uh, maintenance in the future. Next slide, please. So a, a bit going into focus on these um, uh, on these different aspects. Uh, uh, just to highlight out all the things that will also play a part in, in Einstein telescope is it's, we need to think about technical management. The first thing, of course, with technical management is the inventorization of the existing situation. And I think uh, the ET, uh, ET test uh, and so on, these programs, ET Pathfinder, uh, is, it's all about that also. Uh, it's inventorization of the existing uh, geotechnical uh, or geological uh, environment, uh, but it's also testing about what is feasible and what is not feasible and so on. Um, but once you have a green light to go with a, with a project like this, it's also converging and make sure that you are converging and not diverging uh, uh, to a, a final uh, design uh, that corresponds with your objectives. If you talk about technical management for uh, these kind of big projects, you also need to think about staffing. Big projects, many people, many experts. Uh, it, it's not that if you say, okay, we start with this project uh, and we want to start within a month that you have uh, all of a sudden 100 engineers standing ready for you uh, to, do that, uh, to do that project. That's not the case. You need to think very thoroughly about uh, what the market is, uh, what you need, and how to deal with that. And at the same time, you also need to, to involve the right competences with, uh, for mitigating your risks. Uh, find the right match of people or companies and, and competences. Uh, for example, for, for, for this tunnel project, uh, we, we also have, uh, we are setting up a collaboration between Tractabel and Amberg Engineering, who specialized also in internal boring, uh, to, to, uh, to have all the competences that are uh, necessary for projects like this. Next slide, please. Uh, project control, I've mentioned before, very important. Um, it's, uh, it's using tools, it's using processes to guarantee that your project will deliver on time within budget. Uh, and within uh, the uh, objectives that you uh, want to achieve. So you do that with different tools nowadays. So you have uh, systems engineering, uh, which is kind of a multi-dimensional uh, database uh, that links uh, demands, requirements, uh, people, et cetera. Uh, and that can help you get an overview of your project in, in a way that is much more evolved than a simple Excel will. And, and I can guarantee you with a simple Excel, you will not achieve uh, projects like this with this complexity. Um, BIM, uh, building information modeling, uh, also very important nowadays to have digital uh, twin of your, of your uh, asset. Uh, and you need to think about, of course, uh, the, the way how to collaborate between all those different systems, because you have many parties, you have many people, they all work in a different way. They all use different tools, different software. You need to bring that together. So it's uh, really important to have a good setup on that. And of course, uh, project control is also related to planning, uh, monitoring, and cost estimation and monitoring. Next slide, please. Um, environment management. Uh, although Einstein Telescope will be mainly below ground and quite a bit below ground, there are some places where you need to come above ground. Uh, so uh, you, you uh, and even for the underground parts, uh, probably also, uh, you need to uh, know what you are able to do, uh, what you're, uh, what are, what's necessary to do uh, for permitting, uh, what are the procedures, what is the timeline, uh, who are the stakeholders, uh, uh, who is impacted, how much are they impacted. It helps you to get a triage of, of stakeholders and uh, uh, specifically also in the big infrastructure projects in which we are involved. Uh, it's always uh, very much about communication, uh, communication and involvement about what you're doing. And, and sometimes we go that far that we incorporate in our design team uh, stakeholders uh, to make sure that uh, we get uh, a common ground for our design. Next slide, please. 
contract management, I said it before, uh, you work with different parties. Uh, so you need to think about the ways of collaborating with those third parties. Uh, you, of course, you will maximize alignment uh, with, uh, uh, with all these different parties. But of course, you don't have the same objectives always. So you have to see what to do with uh, at the, the areas where you uh, have different objectives. You need to think about that. You need to think about in your contracts. And the better you do that, the better your project will be. Because if you have uh, a bad uh, connection with contracts, and then it's, it's already a, a bad situation from the start. And uh, it really helps uh, in the end to, to, to have a good idea, a good vision about that. It's also about managing and mitigating your risks in that field because you need to define uh, who is the most suitable uh, company or, or organization to take responsibility for some of these risks. Uh, and of course, there's now, uh, nowadays, uh, there are now new types of contracts that are. Uh, popping up in, in the industry that help you deal with that. So you have NEC4 contracts that are also used in, uh, in the Antwerp region and so on. And last slide, please. And last time, uh, well, last thing is uh, project management is, uh, is manage the interaction between the teams uh, and the client, uh, very important also. Uh, and uh, follow up on your uh, objectives and also uh, adjustments. We, we are in here uh, for a long time. It's a long project most of the times. Uh, many things will change. Uh, so you need to be able to deal with that. So you have to aim for a balance between some sort of rigidity or uh, an inflexible uh, structure and approach to, uh, to deal with that. And last but not least, I would say it's uh, one of my personal uh, 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 well, my favorite is also try to have fun in your project. You're, uh, you're here running a marathon with, with uh, many people together for several years. Uh, you have to work together. And so you have to also keep in mind uh, the, the good work and uh, private uh, balance and, and uh, have a fun project. And in my experience, if you uh, if you take some energy and to, to try to achieve that, to, to get a good uh, project team on that, it, it pays off so much in, in the end uh, because uh, it's very easy to to go to emails and, and to stay behind and to hide behind contracts and so on. But in the end, you don't solve it, uh, the real issues that will pop up and uh, well. That's it for me. I see I am uh, uh, two minutes above time, uh, beyond time. I will uh, uh, finalize now. I hope uh, I, it was very short, of course. Uh, I, can, I can talk hours on, on this subject, but I hope it gives an, a little bit of insight about uh, what these kind of big projects are all about uh, regarding management of that, technical management, project management, et cetera. And uh, well, let's hope that we can uh, get this project in our region. Huh? Okay. Thank, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, yeah, almost in time. No worries. Um, yes, we see something. Yeah. Perfect. Let me see it. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Is it fine this way? Yeah, wonderful. Great. So my name is Romy Schlegel. I'm a researcher at the Space Center of, of Liège. So um, I'm not directly related to the e-test uh, project. Actually, I'm a research fellow financed by the European Space Agency. And actually, I created my own project related to the remote sensing analysis of the e-test the e region while it was not actually included in the e-test, the, e the current e-test project. So just to, yeah, to give an overview of what is actually remote sensing, it's the process of detecting and monitoring the physical characteristics of an area by measuring its reflected and emitted radiation at a distance. When we speak about Earth observation, actually it means the information collected from Earth observing satellites or aircraft or can be also drones. 
And there are different types of remote sensing techniques, but the main phases are actually the first one. We have this uh, energy source or illumination, which can be uh, coming from, in, from the sun. And this emission can be, um, so which is um, like um, giving an energy to uh, the earth. So this interaction of the electro electromagnetic energy with the earth surface on the target, it's um, actually uh, resulting on a reflection in a way which is depending on the properties of the target. And then we have the, the sensor, which is uh, recording this uh, emitted or reflected energy from the target or from the, the earth, which actually consists of the, the data input that we get. And then we have the transmission of this um, data process to the, the ground, which uh, is uh, actually our data output. So as an expert, we of course analyze uh, this kind of data and we interpret it. So we have uh, passive and active sensors. The, the passive one is a sensor which measures the energy which occurs actually naturally. So the source is um, the sun and um, it gives you an information of the, the spectral reflectance on the ground, for instance. And when we speak about active uh, remote sensing sensors, we, we are here considering of uh, the own source of energy, which is actually given by, uh, by the satellite in itself, for instance. And for instance, we have uh, this technique, which is called um, synthetic aperture radar um, interferometry, which I'm gonna speak now. So this is actually a technique uh, that I'm using uh, currently in my, in my own research, which actually uses, uh, when we speak about differential in SAR, it uses two different SAR images of the same area, which is uh, actually acquired at two different times. And it allows us to calculate the, the phase difference. So um, when I speak about phase difference, uh, actually in the, in the signal that we obtain, we have a contribution which is coming um, from the water vapor, which is uh, in the atmosphere. We also have a contribution of the, the topography. We have uh, to consider also the, the orbital uh, contribution because of the satellite path. We have also an ambient noise, which is actually due to the, the vegetation, which is present on the, the ground on our, our target. And here we want to know what would be a possible deformation of the ground, so which is the, the phase uh, deformation um, okay. which, which we want. And this phase uh, deformation is calculated um, due to the, with this technique and it allows us to estimate uh, <laughs> ground the deformation of the, of the order of millimeter to centimeters. And this will be actually calculated along this uh, invisible line between the, the targets on the ground and the satellite. So we need to think in one dimension. And uh, this is also according to the properties of our, our SAR uh, or rather um, system that we have uh, in space. But we will calculate uh, th th this difference, which is actually uh, the difference between um, yeah, the satellite ground uh, distance. So it's a really powerful technique uh, because we can cover a really large area. So for instance, the, the full um, yeah, Einstein telescope area. And we have a sensitivity to vertical deformation, which uh, with um, accuracy between millimeter to, um, to centimeters, according to the technique, the insert technique that you are using. We can have the, the evolution over time, um, see if there are some deformations which are um, actually happening. But there are also some limitations. And uh, one limitation would be actually due to the topography of the area. If we have some hills, uh, sometimes the, the line of sight is not actually um, yeah, well, covering some parts which are in some other sides of the mountains, for instance. So there are some SAR properties that you, you need to consider if you want to, to check on some, some slope deformations. 
We also have some decorrelations of the signal. For instance, if we have some snow, some uh, intense rainfall, which are inducing some erosion on, on the soil. We also have the, the influence of the, the vegetation. So for instance, the target that we want to focus on, is it like a tree? Is it like a, a salt which has changed? Or the, this uh, scatter can also change um, over time. And we also have some tropospheric effects that can, uh, can also influence the signal. One other limitation would be also the, um, the velocity of the process that we want to monitor, which can be also too high to be detected by, uh, by this technique. So if I want to focus on the, um, the area, the transborder area between Belgium, uh, the Netherlands and, and Germany, so there are some multi-temporal INSAR techniques which are um, like uh, used uh, in those uh, countries. For instance, in the BGR, they are already creating this um, average uh, velocity map uh, using some Sentinel-1 uh, data and a technique which is called persistent scatters interferometry. As you can see here um, on this slide, actually it's, um, it's only covering the period between 2014 to 2019. So it's not up to date, but it gives you an information on the location where there can be uh, some slope deformation. In the Netherlands, there is uh, another platform which is also used um, and which was developed by SkyGeo, which is uh, really interesting because you can actually also zoom in uh, some location and extract some time series um, to see the, the evolution of slope deformation. And for, for the Belgian side, it's uh, going uh, through the border. So we also have some information uh, on the Einstein telescope uh, area. So for instance, uh, as uh, Frédéric was also mentioning, the, the, Hambourg, uh, the Hambourg area, so here in that location, there will be a, a new borehole. And we want to know if uh, after pumping in this, uh, in this borehole, we will see also some, some evolution of the, the ground over time. And um, this can be also measured by this technique. So on this website here, uh, for instance, if I check on one point, I can see the, the evolution uh, of this uh, deformation uh, on, the, on that specific location. Here, to give you an order of magnitude, we have more or less um, uh, four millimeter per year uh, on that specific location. So yeah, it's quite moving. We can see it's uh, significant enough, but well, it's, um, it's not that much, right? So if we check on the, the Cotesan area uh, that we also mentioned previously, where this uh, borehole was already drilled, uh, here we see also some green points, so some, those coherent reflectors, uh, which are also monitored over time. And here, uh, yeah, we have a velocity of uh, yeah, 1.5 millimeter per year, uh, which is uh, pretty stable uh, in that location. So when I what I want to, to do also in the frame of my, my own project is to cross this information. So the resistance scatter interferometry, all those points um, that I can have uh, over, um, yeah, over the border, as you can see on the, on the figure here with the, the geological context and with uh, some specific fault structures because I want to see if there is uh, an influence of those faults on some potential deformation that I, I, can, uh, I can measure uh, through the, the PSI. I've also used uh, another technique. So before I was uh, speaking about PSI, which is one specific uh, INSAR technique. And now I will speak about uh, the multi-temporal uh, small baseline subset uh, time series which is um, actually uh, an algorithm which was um, developed by um, at the Centre Spatial de Liège and with some other collaborators also based in, the, in Luxembourg at the European Centre for Geodynamics and Seismology. So they also helped me to collect it, uh, all the data in a cloud covering the, um, the Einstein telescope uh, area. 
as you can see here, uh, I was able to retrieve the, um, the ground deformation rates in the up and down um, direction and the in, in the east and west deformation. So as I was speaking before with INSA, we only have uh, the deformation in one direction, in the line of sight direction, but then you can reproject it in the directions you want. And here it's interesting to see that, yeah, according to the reprojection, you don't see, uh, yeah, uh, the same things. What you can see, for instance, is um, on some mines, uh, of course, there are some uh, down deformation. It's here it's uh, Elfdorf in, in Germany, for instance, which is pretty visible in the in the INSAR signal. And if I focus on the the area of the, the Einstein telescope, uh, here also superimposed uh, the fault lines uh, from the, the Belgian side. You now I have to include also those in the, the Netherlands side. Uh, I can also see some, uh, yeah, some signal which is uh, also visible. So what is interesting to see is, um, yeah, of course, uh, here in the Belgian side, we see that um, it's more like uh, a dawn deformation, a maximal dawn deformation, which is uh, which is visible. While um, if I check on the east and west uh, deformation, um, we can see in the southwest of uh, Aachen. Um, yeah, this deformation, which is basically due to the Rhine gravel, which is also visible. So this is just to, to show you this kind of result that, that we can see. And of course, there are also some hotspots area. Um, yeah, here we can see, for instance, uh, uh, red spots, which are most of, in most of the cases, they are located in some uh, yeah, mine activities or where there are some uh, uh, big change in uh, in land cover, for instance, it might be also due to change in the in the crops or pumping uh, area with subsiding uh, subsiding surfaces. So yeah, in those location um, or specifically in the uh, Ombour and Cotesen area, I also want to combine uh, those uh, results, uh, this MS bus results, with the, the proximity to the fault lines, the main fault lines to see if those faults are uh, stable or, or not, because it can be also interesting uh, to know this beforehand, uh, before the, the construction of the, um, the, the Einstein um, telescope. And uh, yeah, this, this is coming to my uh, conclusions, actually open to, to discussion, of course. So I wanted to show you that there are some platforms uh, existing uh, to control slope deformation with INSA at national scale, uh, except for, for Belgium. Actually, for, for Belgium, it's more currently with the Tarasco platform, it's more focusing on uh, yeah, the optical uh, monitoring. So there is no INSA uh, processed in a, yeah, in a continuous uh, basis, let's say, or doing time series to see deformation. But in the future, we will be we, we will have this uh, European uh, ground motion service. So yeah, this might open also some new uh, perspectives. The problem with this is that either this uh, new service or the current um, platforms are doing the monitoring in a continuous or up-to-date manner. So as you have seen also, the monitoring is ending either in 2019 or in 2019. And 21, so we don't have the yeah the current and the, yeah the up to date uh, with the new Sentinel uh, acquisitions in yeah currently happening or uh, happening in the future. I also wanted to precise that the expert knowledge is mandatory to uh, interpret well uh, this remote based information because if we deliver all this to the stakeholders directly, they can be misinterpreted results, which could also lead to some, um, yeah, some problems in the future. And we also uh, con need to consider that there, there is also the need of ground-based measurements, either by permanent uh, GNSS or by uh, IGRS, um, so this uh, integrated um, geodetic station, which uh, are actually developed by uh, the TU Delft, some colleagues there to help uh, validating the these INSA results. So yeah, thank you very much for, for your attention. And uh, yeah, I would be happy to, to answer questions in the future. 
Yeah, thank you for your presentation. Uh, the yeah, question is to all the participants. Um, if you have a question, use the raise hand function, type it in the chat or um, unmute yourself and shoot. Maybe uh, if I can uh, take a first question, what was this object on the bottom right of your last slide? Is this one of the uh, ground-based sensor or? Yeah, it's the IGRS station actually. It's um, a combination between corner reflectors with, integrate, with GNSS station with a leveling, which is actually, yeah, uh, taking some like continuous monitoring on the ground and also having this, um, uh, artificial backscatters, which can also, um, yeah, give a right signal to the, the satellite to be tracked over time. Okay, thank you. Um, more questions? Um, otherwise, we, we also have uh, later the opportunity for further questions. Uh, thank you very much for staying very well in time. Um, then I think we proceed with the next talk. Um, yes. Perfect. Can you see me already? Yes, and, and we here? see already. Yeah, okay. uh, we still see the gray surrounding of the program, but I. Oh. Guess... I'm sorry. That's. Uh... Yeah, the, 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 last time uh, in the testing, you managed it. How did you. Oh, okay. Maybe like let's before. try. Yeah. Let's uh, try. Let's try. Maybe like that. Or did it change something? Not yet. Oh. Well, when, we, when we tested it before the meeting, it worked. I um, do the same, whatever it was. Uh, now yes perfect okay <laughs> fantastic thanks a lot okay so um yes welcome everyone also from my side i am uh, professor florian wellmann from mvth aachen and uh, i'm actually a professor in computational geoscience um, and uh, not so much in virtual environments but i was asked to give you a bit of a an insight into virtual environments uh, and how we relate to this in the context of um, the einstein telescope project so I'm sure some here actually are more experts in, in this virtual environment part, but I try to make a bit this link maybe to, uh, uh, to the data we have, to the models we have, Oops. and how this should be or could be combined uh, in the future to get some uh, insight into, uh, into the subsurface that we need in the context of this project. So um, yes, what are virtual environments? Well, what we have in mind, uh, you know, from a very simple point of view is that we have some sort of a maybe a geological structure or any structure and we want to interact with it and see what happens in, in 3D. Um, but let's actually just before we look into this part, let's take a step back and actually look at uh, a bit more conceptual uh, viewpoint of what virtual env environments actually are. In a very broad sense, we can say uh, generally we look at something which we could call um, virtual representations of some sort of a real world object. This is here from a, a different field a bit, of course, but we have here in you know, from the energy sector, we could say that we have some sort of a, um, a drill rig or something, and we have it in, in reality, and we have a virtual representation. And we try to get those two sides together so that we can actually interact and uh, work with this virtual representation and see the effects in the, in the real world, in a sense. This is something which also leads to uh, concepts of real-time data assimilation, so integration of information to make better predictions. And uh, some of the central characteristics that uh, you, you will find in this context um, are related to uh, connectivity. So basically to have your virtual environment somehow connected to your data input that you're getting in the real world. Uh, aspects of homogenization, which refers to a bit more on the technical side to data and how you are interacting with data in both the real world setting as in this virtual setting. Uh, what is sometimes called smart adjustments, so basically that you are uh, able to make uh, adjustments in your process uh, based on the, um, the results of your simulation or your virtual environment, basically. And also that you have some sort of a digital trace of what you are doing. So basically some way to um, go back once you did an analysis, you want to see why this came to be in a sense. So you want to have an accountability in a sense through your digital virtual environment. And uh, it should be also modular in a sense that you can combine different aspects together, different data types, different simulations. 
and combine them to get basically to a final result in your virtual environment. And uh, all of these concepts um, are quite often also referred to as uh, what's called digital twins of the, the real world. This, of course, also combines all the aspects of simulation and prediction. Uh, in our case, uh, what we look at uh, in the current state, I would say, are, are two components of this big field and uh, two things that we would like to combine. One of them is actually the information about the subsurface of geology and rock properties. And we've seen already fantastic examples before in the talks before. Um, and you know, basically the aspects that are then relevant for groundwater prediction or also the tunneling predictions or the engineering prediction. And we want to combine this also with these engineering aspects um, and the actual construction um, that is happening and the objects that are built underground and above ground potentially as well. So let's see uh, briefly how these things could be combined uh, in a very, you know, like geological modeling in, in two minutes. Uh, this is of course not, uh, not uh, the area of the Einstein telescope, this is somewhere in the Pyrenees. Um, but you, you see basically this is a, a typical rock structure in an orogenic setting here. We see we have this, uh, these different rock layers and um, of course we can see this sometimes nicely in mountain belts. We can look at the rocks and we can identify them. The problem is of course now in, in our region here uh, that we talk about, we, we don't see this. This is all above, uh, below, below ground, right? And the difficulty is that we cannot directly see it uh, to look at all this complexity. So we need to substitute basically, we need to find ways to look into this subsurface and uh, we have all of these different scales of observations. We have some areas where we see significant changes of rock properties. Uh, we see, if you zoom in a bit, we see some smaller sections where we see maybe similar rock type, but different properties. And this goes on, you know, to very small scales. So we cannot see it. Uh, what can we do? Well, what we do, you already saw this in the, in the previous talks, of course. Um, is that we, that we take information from, let's say, for example, boreholes here, where we have a lot of direct observations and indirect observations in seismic measurements. And I'll show some more examples of this uh, in a minute. In the end, the aim is to reconstruct then this picture of this geological setting of these major geological interfaces based on all of this um, partly direct but very sparse or indirect and more widely available information. So what we want to end up with is a representation of geological features. We can, we can think here of uh, aspects like fault zones or uh, discontinuities in, in, in the rock structure due to fracturing, uh, what we've seen also in the last talk. Um, and we have maybe some relevant interfaces between different geological layers. But if we also zoom inside, then we also, you know, with a smaller scale, we also see that we have maybe properties, rock properties inside the subsurface, which are also, of course, not completely the same everywhere within one layer, but which are also changing due to, um, due to local variations in this uh, geological system. Let's see a bit now what this means in the context uh, of the Einstein telescope after this uh, five minute introduction to geological modeling. Um, if you just a, a movie that uh, uh, one of our uh, researchers made, Niels, who is also working, Niels Trudala, who is also working in the Einstein Telescope project. And this is just a bit of the setup. Uh, we've seen this uh, already before in a couple of the examples, but you know that the main challenge is basically uh, to find uh, the best uh, region now where we can place, to start with, where we can place the, uh, this telescope object. And just to give you a bit of a sense of scale, I think it's quite nice to see here when we look at the scale of the cities around it that, of course, we're looking at a major uh, structure and would like to see how we can best place this in the first stage right now. So what we do is we need to characterize the subsurface uh, in this entire context. And um, this comes together in these aspects of geological modeling and geophysical investigations. We've already seen here an example of this model before. This is an actual representation of the features we expect in the subsurface below uh, this region in the Einstein telescope region. And we combine different uh, aspects from borehole data, profiles, maps, and so on integrated in this 3D structural setting. 
So this is, uh, of course, a difficulty in itself. Um, what I'm not going to talk about too much about uh, here on the technical side, I think what is really interesting to think uh, about first is actually the challenge of data integration when we think about these virtual environments in a sense. So we've already seen this again in the talks before that we have these different types of data sets already on the geological side when we look at integration of borehole data, geophysical measurements and geological knowledge. And the big challenge is to combine this then with aspects of the more civil engineering aspect of the um, of the project. Also something which I'm going to mention, but this is uh, um, maybe best seen with a couple of examples. Uh, we've also seen already something about the borehole, um, the examples before. And uh, again, I'm sure many of you have seen uh, how this works, but just to give you also a bit of a more schematic idea. Um, if you think of a, a drill rig somewhere, we're drilling in these sites uh, that we've seen in the last presentation already. What is actually happening, of course, is we are drilling down to this target depth and then we are extracting information in geological in cores, basically, of this borehole. And inside of these cores, we have a lot of precise information, but of course, at a very small scale, you know, think of this borehole as, um, you know, in the, in the decimeter range. And then we can go ahead and also take geophysical measurements in these boreholes. And we see here an example of a, of a wireline lock represented where we take measurements and get some more information in the surrounding area of this borehole. So this gives us very precise information, but also uh, only at very um, dedicated point in space, in a sense. Now, if we need to combine this, uh, we'd like to extend this now to a wider range. And this is already where we've seen uh, examples of ERT before, and uh, Fred and Guyen already mentioned the, um, the seismic uh, campaign that is going to uh, be part of this study as well. And what is happening there is that we are basically emitting sound waves into the, uh, or seismic waves into the subsurface. Uh, and uh, where we expect, where we have some important uh, features, changes of properties in the subsurface, this leads to a change in the um, distribution of the seismic waves. And this is something that we can then observe and measure at the surface again in, uh, in sensors, represented here, basically placed at the surface. And combining all of this information gives us again some of this more partial information in the subsurface. Now, why is this all relevant? Well, in the end, the point is that we put all of this information somehow together into uh, a geological model, but you've seen now a bit the complexity of the model with all these faults uh, in a large scale area. We're talking, of course, about uh, tens of kilometers. Then we have some very precise information, high resolution on a millimeter scale or even below in boreholes. And we have these uh, seismic uh, measurements that we have partially in space and ERT data. And uh, we believe that one really big uh, challenge here is to get all of this information into one environment, that we, into one virtual environment, where we then see where we have information. We can see the interpretation. We can maybe even make interpretation, uh, interpretations in this 3D virtual space, uh, which guides us a bit more our understanding of the subsurface to be able to make better predictions. I have here one example um, of a tool where this has already been partly, uh, where this is partly tested by Terranigma Solutions. So this is a prototype uh, example here of uh, one of these setups which uh, already integrates some aspects of this virtual environment. But you see here that we have um, an example of this model that we saw before. And we can see uh, the geological structures inside and we can see how we can move into this uh, object already into this 3D space. We have ERT data in here. So this is one of the other data sets we've seen before. And um, the challenge of course would be to get more information in there to help us gain a better understanding of um, the subsurface in the ET region. Then I mentioned already this uh, link to uh, civil engineering. And um, because what we've seen right now was the uh, geological as the geological structure, a lot of this is not very well known, or we need to infer the position of these structures from our measurements. 
If, on the other hand, we do a civil engineering project, we plan this ahead and we know, of course, quite well what we will build and what is actually there. So we, this is a different world. And in this virtual setting, we can bring those two hopefully together. At least that's one of the challenges here. This is an example from a, a Unity technology report on trends in architecture, engineering and construction. Uh, and I think it gives a bit the idea of where this, uh, where this way is going. We see here a lot of pipe works um, in a, uh, an underground system here. We see actual uh, pictures behind it or um, a, um, a view basically on this on the, on the reality. And we see how this real setting basically and this, uh, this expected piping here is combined in this virtual environment. So the big challenge will be, uh, we think in this context of the uh, ETES project to bring both of these sites together. So on one hand, uh, this uh, aspect of geology and geophysics and all the data that we integrate into these subsurface geological models with these uh, engineering aspects um, that we can then, of course, also see when we have this, the tunneling projects, for example, that we see uh, where we expect uh, the, the tunnels to be in which geological setting, which properties do we expect, how will this uh, influence the groundwater and so on. A very small note on uh, technologies, that's something where, which is really in terms of expertise, uh, that's outside of my expertise, but of course, just to give you a bit of an insight what is available and why also this is maybe something that we can do now that we can take the step to combine geology and engineering here um, because we've seen in, in the last years as uh, i'm sure all of you are aware we have seen a surge in um, developments on the hardware side for virtual reality glasses uh, and also augmented reality glasses in all kinds and of and of varieties mostly for gaming but also a lot in um, in engineering, in architecture, in, in, in serious uh, real world applications, of course. The most important point with all these developments is that we've seen the costs going down significantly. So this is something which used to be in the more specialized market. It's now really in the, in the consumer market segment. And at the same time, we see all these developments on the, on the software side. Uh, so I, I already mentioned one software Unity uh, before, which is a game engine but also used a lot in, uh, in real applications, uh, let's say. Unreal, another one, Blender is a 3D modeling engine. Autodesk, Sketchfab allow you to generate these models as well. So there is a lot of software right now uh, already available out of the box in a sense. The question is in the context now of um, ET to SME maybe and, and e-test in general, uh, or the Einstein telescope, how, how, how can we combine all of these elements to get a better insight into the subsurface and the combination with these, um, with these technical and civil engineering aspects. Um, Mr. Meyer already mentioned at the beginning uh, uh, the ET technology sheets. So if you want to see a bit more about where we see you know, requirements for the developments, this is in this uh, in the technology sheets and simulation and modeling. Uh, you can see down here there are two segments on uh, collaborative research in joint um, virtual environments, and also one on challenges in geo modeling and geo beam integration. And what you see here on the left side, earthquake, ambient noise, uh, and propagate wave propagation simulations also add on to this aspect of geological modeling, property estimation, and then also simulations and virtualization. Okay, thanks a lot for listening. This was then my contribution here. I hope we could get, give you some insight and of course, happy to answer uh, any questions there as well. Okay, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, then we come to the networking part now. Um, I will open up uh, to breakout rooms now uh, for all of you to join. Um, these breakout rooms, uh, um, you're free to jump between this one, this is the main room, and the two breakout rooms. The two breakout rooms have a, a topic name, so where, where it should or it will be more focused talks about the um, about the, the talks we just heard about this, the, the connected technology, so remote sensing and virtual environment and simulation are the two rooms. Um, feel free to switch between them. You find them also in the, the gray bar on the bottom. Once you are in a room, um, 
where you can uh, on the right uh, bottom side you have this leave and then you can decide if you leave the hall or you just leave the breakout room then you go back to the main room so um yep there we go there should be a window now in your in the center of your screen to uh join the rooms um looking forward to the discussions and uh, thanks again to all the speakers um if you have questions now go to the rooms discuss uh, looking forward to it